interlinked with uh, landslide and statistics. Actually, I am a geologist by background. I always say that I'm trained to lick rocks. And then I did a postdoc in statistics. So uh, that's where my research comes from. So I'm trying to predict uh, landslide occurrences. And today the talk is going to be about uh, essentially the research direction that we are taking here at ITC as a group, not just myself, not just Case Mambesa, but all together, together with our students actually. Uh, and to predict landslide occurrences, so susceptibility, to predict how threatening they may be, so landslide hazard, and the type of impact that they may have, so landslide risk. So and with this in mind, I will share my screen. Hopefully it will appear in a second there. Just let me know whenever it uh, appears on your side. No. Maybe I'll keep it this way. Oh, damn it. You can change like uh, the, you can go up again to presentation mode. And just uh -huh. you know, at the middle it says display settings on the top part. Uh, the, oh, yeah, here. Yeah, so is that here. Duplicate. Oh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. So uh, can you see the screen, right? I guess so, because yes. it helped me a lot. So yeah, so that basically, that's the idea. So I will present uh, the research direction and the type of uh, application we have developed in the last two years, and specifically uh, through the master thesis of our students, uh, which uh, have, uh, I'd say helped us a lot to 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 develop this research direction together with them. So, I just uh, as a brief mention is that uh, we use the terms natural hazard quite a lot, uh, but uh, research directions in in research time uh, have been questioned a little bit the terms natural of this hazard component. So, one of the thing that we have to think about is that uh, in the uh, moment that we live on in the specific uh, Anthropocene that we are living in. Uh, one of the main requirements for us to build the good predictive models would be to decouple the anthropic effect from the actual natural hazard effect. So in order for us to, to actually be able to predict it. So we are here right now and uh, yeah, more and more papers are now pointing out at this direction. So I'm not gonna stop here. This was just an occasion for me to, to showcase a couple of examples here. And uh, this is a uh, big disaster uh, between uh, Germany, Belgium, and the Netherlands uh, last year. And there are more and more uh, evidence that uh, anthropic control, anthropic influence on our landscape is contributing to those hazards. So if we want to, build the data-driven models, which is the type of science that I mainly do. De decoupling this component is a fundamental requirement also to be able to uh, predict them in a suitable manner. But this being said, so again, so another element uh, that is uh, of particular evidence uh, when we try to do to work on natural hazards here at ITC is the um, let's say, how can I put it? Not modeling just single hazards anymore, but uh, modeling chain of hazards. So uh, from one type of event, those that will cascade from them. And there are extremely, uh, let's say, appalling examples of uh, uh, hazards, for example, earthquakes, the one that I'm presenting here, for example, the Wenchuan earthquake, that uh, the earthquake in itself is damaging, uh, our society, but uh, as a byproduct of it, it triggers uh, landslides and uh, the landslide will damage our society, but as a byproduct of them, they will dam rivers. And then with the first rainfall in coming, uh, the river may, uh, let's say, breach the dam and flood the landscape here. So actually this is an actual uh, chain of event that uh, <clears throat> that happened in Wanchuan is very well documented. So one of the things that we are trying to do here is also not trying to model just, not just decoupling uh, anthropic influence on natural uh, hazards, but also modeling multi-hazard uh, processes and how these may interact with, the, with each other. So for example, one of, of these examples is here, the example of the Chichi earthquake. Um, and after that, we have continuous repetitions of uh, monsoons, which are perturbing an already uh, 
weakened uh, uh, landscape like the Taiwanese here in, in this figure. And therefore, the landslide dimension, how large they are, are uh, shifted in space and time in terms of how much big they may be. So one of the things that I would like to point out before going into details is that in order for us to really model these things, and uh, let's say data-driven modeling is a uh, fancy way uh, nowadays to do most of the things. Everybody says, okay, we're working on artificial intelligence, we're working on machine learning, deep learning, but a real important requirement is to never forget that we are scientists and ask ourselves the right question, what are the uh, information that we train our models with in order for us to predict suitably the type of phenomena that we want to model. Otherwise, the outcome that we obtain is quite uh, poor or not really reliable. So with this, I will jump on uh, the main topic that I would like to discuss here. And it starts with, uh, let's say, criticizing a little bit uh, the status quo or basically what uh, what we inherited since 1972 from Brab, which is this concept that uh, uh, the probability of uh, uh, landslide occurrence in space sort of is static in time. So we take some uh, landslide inventory, we do some spatial statistics tricks, and we generate uh, some uh, <clears throat> uh, susceptibility models or a map that tells us the probability, low, medium, high, or whatever we want in the middle, that, uh, uh, that a landslide may occur at a given location or not. There are two uh, weaknesses with it. First is that uh, the static uh, behavior of the landscape in releasing landslide, in reality, is not static at all. It may really change. Uh, the landscape is changing in itself, and also the way that the landscape is interacting with, for example, earthquakes or with uh, rainfall is also very different. So the spatial distribution of the probability of lensar occurrences changes dynamically in time. So we have the need for dynamic probability models. And uh, another element is that uh, when we look at this probability of occurrence, we are just looking at uh, one component of the other definition. Because if a landslide occurs, and it's relatively small, a one by five, one by 10 meters uh, in dimension and size, that may not really affect uh, our society. Whereas if that landslide is much larger than that, it may cause a disaster. It may cause an actual loss. So this vision that everybody uh, let's say, put the effort for a spatial prediction purely on landslide occurrences. It's something that we critically uh, reflect on here at ITC. And I will show you in a bit what we are trying to do in that sense, not only predicting landslide occurrences, but also how big they, they may be. So one of the things that, uh, uh, that I still consider valuable in the sense of uh, working on uh, spatial probability alone in a traditional manner is where we are working on a very large landscape. In that sense, this is something that I still consider um, uh, respectable or valuable for us because, for example, um, in, the, in our need to represent the lens like dynamics in space and time, the kinetic energy that they may be associated with, we have the need to collect geotechnical parameters in order for us to, to solve physical equations, geomechanical uh, equations of landslide initiation and propagation. But this is unfeasible, especially here at the scale. Here, uh, I, I put, a uh, let's say, the, the master thesis of Matteo Moreno Zapata, a student I supervise and a very close friend working at EURAC in Italy at the moment. And in that sense, what we tried to do with him was, okay, to isolate catchments. So we try to divi divide the Colombian landscape into catchments and then extrapolate for each one of them or estimate for each one of them the probability of having a, um, a torrential flow uh, in them. So basically um, with the idea in mind of prioritizing where to do some physically based modeling. So in that sense, it's something that I value spatial statistics a lot, but 
uh, something that I would also value is for us to uh, also estimate uncertainties around this. Because one of the things that everybody does is just, okay, throws the data into a model, into an AI, get the output, produce this map to the left, and everybody's happy with it. What I struggle with, though, is the idea that that's the, that's the end of it. Because a, a low probability of landslide occurrences associated with low uncertainty is one thing, low probability of landslide occurrences associated with high uncertainty is a very different topic. And the same thing goes, for example, for, my, for a high susceptibility uh, catchment with low uncertainty and a high susceptibility catchment with high uncertainty. Because in the end, we will never have the, the ability to model all these red catchments properly, right? So we need some way of prioritizing what to do uh, and how to do it. So in that sense, what I would do is to extract, for, for example, from my prediction map, all the catchment with high probability of landslide occurrence that have also very low uh, uncertainty in them. So this is one of the things that we are doing systematically here at ITC. And uh, something that we consider also important is to not just focus on space, but also look at what uh, we can do in time. And this is essentially like how early warning systems are built at the moment across the world. So they do, so instead of doing spatial statistics, these are more temporal statistics based tools. And uh, what we struggle here, uh, or we believe here at ITC, that it is a, a valuable um, field of study is to actually combine space and time together rather than keeping them separately. And there is, um, you will see it, uh, all these elements, intensity, uncertainty, as I move forward in my presentation, I will call them back. But at the moment, we have that NASA uh, is producing now data-driven space-time models for landslide occurrences. This is exactly uh, what we envision as well here at ITC. So not only building spatial statistics, like the, the example from susceptibility that I mentioned before, not just the temporal statistics that is typical of rainfall threshold, but really combine these two elements together. Because maybe I didn't mention it before, but these uh, early warning systems are only ex exclusively based on rainfall. So we take, uh, landslide presence and absences, and we regress them or we classify them according on the rainfall signal. And that's it, only according to rainfall. Whereas what we saw before here, for example, this is purely static in space. So we take the presence absence of landslides and we regress them or classify them according to landscape characteristics. A combination of the landscape characteristics and of the rainfall is very rare, and yet it is the right way or the most intuitive way that she, we should work on. And we were happy to see this work from uh, Stanley, uh, and in general from the um, NASA Goddard, Goddard Space Center, uh, led by um, uh, Dalia Kirschbaum uh, now, that they are trying to develop this tools. Uh, but at the same time, the tool that they developed, because it's NASA, it's such a big group, that they try to develop uh, um, global tools and global tools at the same time, they are a little bit of limited use if you want to put it this way, because the rainfall product that they rely on are also what 10 by 10 kilometers, 25 by 25 kilometers. We are looking at past product with TRMM, and therefore it is it loses a little bit the meaningful requirement that we look for when we try to communicate hazard and landslide prediction in general to townships, to uh, provinces, because on a five, 25 by 25 or on a 10 by 10 kilometers, there is little action that we can do. So when I uh, talk about the space time here, as you can see, this is just one kilometer. And if you see, you will see the map changing. Here at ITC, what we try to do, this is uh, Janur Erolo, uh, a student, uh, she will graduate uh, in a month. And she tried to do a space-time model. So it's a model that knows how the landscape is characterized. So geology, slope, aspect, and whatnot, together with temporally dynamic characteristics, such as wildfire occurrences, because wildfire changes the soil hydrology quite uh, drastically, as well as the rainfall pattern in there. 
So this is the, the type of thing that we're trying to do here. And uh, the thing is that with the requirement for space-time modeling comes the requirement of getting space-time distribution of landslides. Otherwise, we cannot train any AI to predict them in space and time to begin with, right? So we need some sort of uh, multi-temporal landslide inventory to train our, our models with. And uh, uh, what we're trying to do here at IDC is essentially to use a change detection algorithm. For example, this is one of the easiest way to do it, but these are typically working extremely well in subtropical areas where the difference in spectral signal between vegetated and non-vegetated areas, where the non-vegetated ones are typically the one that uh, uh, hosted a landslide. And now you have the, the soil naked and visible from the satellite. So these type of change detection algorithm are good, but they're not the only solution as well to produce a consistent space-time distribution of landslide to train our data-driven models. So another way that we can solve this is <clears throat> instead of doing change detection per se, just on basis of simple NDVI indices, what we try to do is uh, to do more uh, sophisticated models, for example, with uh, object-based uh, uh, image analysis, so OBIA, or even use deep learning architectures, uh, which are particularly nice because, uh, this, let's say, they are able to connect, uh, let's say, um, similar in this figure, they are able to connect bodies of a landslide that normally our expert eye would connect. But uh, in most of the cases, even the um, <clears throat> change detection algorithm would never capture the fact that they are simply disjointed in there. Um, yeah, so this was the example from Obia. And these are other things that we are trying to do here. So this is Kushanav Buyan, another student here at ITC whose uh, master uh, and PhD work is focused on generating multi-temporal landslide inventories uh, through deep learning architectures. And this is particularly useful because then we can open so many doors because not only we can model landslide occurrences as I initially introduced, but also their size because we nice delineate how large these landslides may be. Okay, so but what do we do when we have a cloud cover that is negatively affecting our optical record of the Earth's surface? So in this case, there is little to do. Optical satellite is simply, their vision is simply shielded uh, or hindered by clouds. So either we wait or we can look, for example, uh, SAR imaging and then do chain amplitude change uh, that sometimes work quite nicely. You can see here the two images. They are nicely depicting, um, let's say, the, the, the landslide event that you can see here, just based on the coherence that has been lost between one SAR image and another uh, SAR image right after. Uh, but also in this case, SAR has its own weaknesses. So in highly vegetated areas, it would struggle to see through uh, the vegetation, the dense vegetation. So uh, what we are trying to do, this is now the thesis of uh, Priscilla niyokiri uh She's a master student I have supervised last year. Uh, she, she used exactly a combination of optical um, and SAR amplitude change, automated or semi-automated detection, I should say, for uh, the uh, landslide mapping in the country of Malawi in Central Africa, where she managed to map 4,600 landslides, if I'm correct, or in that order, for a total of 26 separate uh, rainfall events. So she was able to characterize sort of the entirety of the space-time landslide dynamics for the entire country uh, of Malawi. And uh, so she did an incredible uh, job. She worked for basically five months to take care of this, uh, let's say, semi-automated landslide generation in space and time. 
And then she worked to validate each one of this and correct the, the landslide information through manual uh, corrections. So this is the, the depth of her initial work. And uh, at the end of it, what we tried to do, we tried to go back to the concept of rainfall threshold as it is traditionally made. And we sort of derived for clusters of slopes with similar, let's say, uh, length, shape, and uh, steepness characteristics. Uh, she tried to derive uh, um, threshold of landslides, uh, sorry, thresholds of uh, uh, rainfall intensities. Uh, so we tried to regress essentially the landslide distribution in uh, space and time for the entirety of the countries and for each one of these clusters. So you will see cluster one, cluster two, and cluster three. And uh, funny enough, uh, the actual uh, rainfall measure that explained the most, the space time distribution of landslide across the given the entire country was the rainfall uh, of the first day uh, of the landslide um, occurrence in itself. So as, as if no um, distribution of rainfall prior to that date had any influence in changing the hydrology, for example, which is typically what we look for when we're looking for intensity duration relationships. And this, we spoke about this, and it's mostly our interpretation is that uh, um, there are uh, monsoon incoming that uh, release very large quantities of water in a very impulsive manner. And for the rest of the time, the period that may be quite dry in there. So again, this is sort of one of the direction we are trying to do here. So reconstructing, if not the space-time dynamics, the space-time distribution of landslides. And then for a master thesis, this was already a gigantic effort. And therefore, we, we explored purely the, uh, let's, let's, let's say, the traditional rainfall threshold approach. After that, um, or after that, uh, another student, uh, Manur Ahmed, another master student I supervised, um, she instead focused more on methodological development. So she could access um, the multi-temporal inventory for North Viet Vietnam, uh, for which we had a series of uh, uh, landslide cluster and mapped automatically by NASA already. And for this, basically, she extracted six inventories for which the date was sort of uh, constrained already by NASA. And these are the number of landslides that each one of these clusters colored here uh, could contain. So this was a satisfying number of landslides to build a space-time model, uh, as I tried to infer or mention before. So what uh, she tried to do initially was to sort of uh, test any uh, rainfall aggregation date. So we try to respect the uh, rainfall threshold approach. So we regressed landslide present substance against uh, rainfall for the first day, second day, third day, fourth day, all in accumulated manner. And each one of these measurements was modeled separately together with landscape characteristics. So slope, geology, aspect, what is the traditional susceptibility modeling typically requires. And uh, what we uh, discovered is that uh, the, uh, uh, the best model we got uh, was a model that had, I mean, the landscape characteristics are sort of time invariant, slope, elevation, aspect, and geology, they are the same. And for the rainfall, uh, the predictor that we integrated in this space-time model was a, um, was a accumulated window uh, for the rainfall up to eight days prior to the landslide date. Okay, so our model had essentially a regression coefficient estimated for the slope, for the uh, planar curvature, or the other characteristics that typically we have, but also for the rainfall distribution for eight days prior of uh, prior to the landslide occurrence. So this was our first attempt to space-time modeling for landslide. And uh, yeah, again, these are the regression coefficient that I was mentioning before. And our performance was extremely high. As you can see, the median of a, an iterated the bootstrapped uh, uh, approach was above 80, uh, 86, uh, 87 actually, uh, of AUC area under the curve, where 
for those that are less accustomed with the concept, uh, the AUC is sort of the closer to one, the better the performance. Actually, one is an ideal model that does not make any error at all, while 86 is quite an outstanding uh, model performance in itself. And then she was able, of course, to create uh, basically one prediction for, for every time. So this is the dynamic variation of probability that I was mentioning before, and also introducing the uncertainty estimation that I was mentioning before. So we had also the, this sort of movie-like um, animation of our probability of lens cell occurrences which was a function of the terrain characteristics, as well as a function of the rainfall stress in the area. And once you have this, you can still back propagate the problem to a purely spatial one, as if in traditional susceptibility is done, because you can sort of calculate the mean behavior of all the temporal domain that you considered and look sort of no matter what the weather was across the 10 years under considerations, these were the slope that were most likely to undergo. So these are type of uh, long-term planning information that we can share with uh, mayors uh, in a town and with territorial management practices. So we can backtrack it to a static problem, but we can also try to create this model in a sort of a near real time uh, servicing where we are basically generating probability in near real time as the rainfall comes in. Okay, so this model was validated, was built for this area, and we tried to test it also for uh, areas uh, um, outside the north of Vietnam. And uh, uh, it, it really performed quite well for this uh, area in the Southeast Asia, uh, though for one area I was predicting quite bad. Can you see uh, 0.63 here for some reason? Uh, uh, we think that the, the geology here may have been very different, radically different from what was here. So in the sense also, uh, when I was saying before, never trust too much your, your model, always try to criticize it. Here we tried it in spatial transferability with spatial transferability purposes. And we can see that for certain areas, it is not really valid. So space and time together, good, but always with a critical eye, okay? Uh, one, one, what we tried to do with uh, uh, Manur uh, uh, was to create a sort of dynamic lens susceptibility in real time. Uh, and if we have some minutes after this talk, uh, for those that have a recording accessible for them about this talk, you can basically click this link, which I will try to do it at the very end for a couple of minutes, and see essentially that we've built an app on Google Earth Engine where you can select a day and run your model and generate a direct prediction, an interactive prediction on your own computer, though the model was trained with chirps. So, it always has a 15 days latency with respect to the date that you, the, the current date. So if I want to have a prediction for today as we speak, as I'm talking right now, I will need to wait for 15 days to have that information available. Therefore, it is useless for predictive purposes. It is useless for early warning purposes. Though for us, it was the first protocol, the first attempt, to a prototype of early warning system that are based entirely on space-time uh, statistics. Um, so these are uh, basically what, what we try to do in terms of space-time. And then I was saying also when I started this, uh, this uh, presentation that also we criticize this idea of susceptibility per se. Why do we have to focus only on presence, absence, conditions, and that's it. This binary framework may not be the end of it, may not be everything that we want to know, right? It, engineers go much beyond this. They calculate velocities, they calculate volumes, a mass force, they calculate quantities, then in data driven modelings, of course, we will never calibrate a model to solve them. But at the same time, we could do something that is a proxy for the damage in modeling the size. Okay. So to the, here I will basically show you an example of what I'm trying to say. So let's assume that I have this uh, 
uh, slope partition, slope one, slope two, slope three, slope four, and in red, we have the landslides, okay? What a binary model, a susceptibility model will do, it will see all these as zeros, okay? So places where no landslides occurred, and it will see these slopes as places where landslide did occur. But I hope that you see it with me as well, that here we have a, just a tiny, tiny uh, landslide, whereas here we have much larger ones. So training a model to distinguish a binary condition, zero one, means that the model will be blind to the differences between this tiny one that probably will cause little to no damage, and actually this one that will be much more threatening and much more dangerous. So my question is to you, can we do more than this? And uh, this is particularly in my research, if I have to be uh, completely honest. So uh, uh, one of the things that I tried to focus on was to propose models that go beyond the zero one paradigm. And I tried to propose models that can predict landslide counts. So how many landslides per slope? And as you can see here now, it will be a drastic difference because we'll sort of reflect here the fact that the slope has many more landslides as compared to this one. But somebody can tell me, but, well, Luigi, but this one was a very large one and this one is very small. So your problem is not solved yet. So for this reason, what, what I tried to do in my own research was to actually propose another type of model, which is instead looking at landslide areas. So we compute the sum of all the landslide uh, areas or surfaces per slope, and then create an artificial intelligence that instead is trained to predict how landslides uh, may end up being in terms of their planimetric extent, in terms of their area, so how large they are. And uh, uh, I have really, I consider myself uh, not lucky, just privileged to, to have been able to supervise uh, a Chinese student that left ye uh, yesterday actually, uh, went back to China. And with him, we worked especially on this topic. So we tried to predict how lar large landslides may be, but still keeping, respecting the idea of space-time modeling. So we had 20, uh, sorry, 15 inventories. We calculated the landslide areas. And then as you can see, we generated prediction for how large they may be. So this is in logarithmic scale of the meter square. And as you can see, we can capture this. We can predict how lar large landslides may be in space and time. Uh, these are performance metrics, doesn't really matter, with very limited errors. And this is an information that um, uh, municipality towns, they may want to know uh, in order to make more uh, hazard tailored uh, mitigation practices rather than just looking at the susceptibility problems. And uh, same as I showed you before, you can have a space time prediction of landslide sizes, which is something that almost nobody, no, nobody does. Sure, sometimes it works quite well, Sometimes it really underestimates the, the actual landslide area. Sometimes it overestimates. So it's a statistical model. We cannot um, have complete confidence in it. I'm always saying be critical with the data-driven uh, tools that you develop, but for sure this can be an incredible additional tool uh, to help our research. And uh, uh, again, in one of my other uh, lucky moments in my life, I am the PhD supervisor of uh, Ashok Dahal, who is instead focusing on doing spatio-temporal model that are actually combining the two things. Because what we saw here is that we can predict how large landslide may be, but we don't know whether that slope is susceptible to begin with. So what Ashok is doing is trying to predict landslide susceptibility in space and in time. So the every row is a different time, a different season actually. Uh, and uh, the first column is the probability of landslide occurrence. This is the probability of landslide area or area density. Uh, and then hazard is the actual combination of the two. And if you look at this, the performance are amazing. So why do we have to limit ourselves to look on uh, susceptibility, probability of lesser occurrences purely in space, where we can model space, time, probability of occurrence, and probability of size? 
So this is the type of application that we are doing here at ITC. Uh, beyond that, the problem is that even here, we're just looking at past event, like what I mentioned for the rainfall. We don't have that ability to look forward. So uh, uh, we are trying to do, uh, we are trying to train model for the past and then use simulations of earthquake in this case to make prediction for what would be the probability pattern in time if one of the ground motion uh, maps would be uh, for a different rupture, a different earthquake and so on. But these are service. So it's easy for us to generate and take it from the USGS. But what about, uh, and then you can obtain, sorry, temporal summaries. Uh, what is the maximum probabilities irrespective of all these simulations? Uh, here we have a small animation of it, which I will cut it for uh, times of recent. But uh, uh, so the idea is, how do we do it for uh, rainfall induced landslides here? So here is the research of another student, uh, Shutong Wang. Uh, that I also supervised, and we focused on this area where the most fatality, fatalities for rainfall-induced landslides in Turkey occurred in the last 50 years. And uh, as you can see, we have a good network of uh, weather stations uh, here uh, in uh, these black dots. And what we tried to do with uh, Shutong was um, to look at the forecasted rainfall for those locations which we know it's very different. The only grail for all of us landslide scientists would be to be able to use forecasted rainfall for the future that actually matches the measurement that we get at the rain gauge. But this is never the case, unfortunately, until now to the very least. So with Shutong, we were trying to level the difference between forecasted rainfall from satellite products an actual rainfall measured at the rain gauge. So this is a bias reduction problem solving uh, application. And uh, here you can see, for example, okay, this is the prediction we got. This is the interpolation of the weather stations. And these two below, these are forecasted rainfall. So this is important because we can convert the forecasted rainfall into a rainfall pattern that is much more similar to the actual one. And then we can use this information as part of our model so that we can move past the idea of just working on rainfall forecast and moving towards landslide forecast. So this was the work of uh, Shuton. Oopsie. And uh, you can see that uh, what she did is, this was the uh, actual rain gauge measurement interpolated. This was the actual forecast. Here you see a small dot, but in reality there are thousands of landslides occurring here. But the point that I would like to make is that this, if we would have used the rainfall forecast for this specific event, we would have predicted zero probability and said to the population, okay, go out, go do shopping, whatever, be happy, jump, uh, dance on the street. And then there we may have had some loss, life lost in there because the forecast was predicting absolutely zero rainfall. But if we use an AI to improve the rainfall from uh, the forecast, Actually, this is what we had here, that uh, the location where we had thousands of landslides, it's now enriched or shows a pattern where we have actual rainfall predicted at that location in space and in time as well. So maybe the, the plan for the future is to not work with past rainfall events alone, but use forecasted one for prediction, but change them, improve them, with data-driven models that can improve, they can reduce this bias that we are facing. But even in this case, at the moment, we have another issue, and it's the fact that these rainfall forecasts, they are kilometers in resolution, 10 kilometers, five kilometers, not actually five, it's the best that we have, I think, uh, as a global product. It was recently released, the, the CHIRPS forecast, but it's still five by five. Normally it's 10 by 10 with an iMERGE, for example. So how do we improve the resolution? Because landslides are manifesting at a much smaller scale than the kilometers of these products. And what we try to do here at ITC uh, um, 
here is a work I have to share with uh, a colleague from the UCL, uh, Aldo Lipani, a close friend. We try to use super resolution algorithm. So these are algorithms comes from uh, um, the, the, the artificial intelligence community, so computer science. Uh, uh, and what they do, they learn from course images and improve them. Okay, and this you can use it also for rainfall, just that instead of having a spatial problem like the one you see here, you convert it in a space time one. And uh, here is a rainfall image on a five by five kilometers, as I mentioned before. And you can see three tests of three different neural networks to improve the image exactly as you saw here. Huh? So this is the five by five. This is improved, improved, improved. And you will see in the last one, the actual recording. And now I will zoom in and I will ask you if you can see any difference. So what we, this is, by the way, I'm also surprised, I'm amazed about this. Um, I'm still doubting, we just finished this thesis. So um, we are looking into this, okay? Uh, I am, uh, 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 I want to go a bit slower here, um, but this is the type of application that we would like to test to reduce the bias, but also, uh, reduce the coarse capability of explaining the spatial temporal pattern of rainfall. Okay, so you will see this is the ground truth, and this is the the uh, image converted from this coarse one, and the matching is quite astonishing. I hope you agree with me. So this is another uh, type of uh, uh, application, and I didn't mention his name. So the student is uh, Zan Yuan Li, and there's also another a student that I've been supervising for the last year. But uh, what about risk? So um, all this is uh, susceptibility, hazard, but we are still far away from knowing what is the impact that these processes. So uh, with another, uh, I, I hate to be repeating, but I want to mention all these names. Nan Wang, uh, she's a PhD student uh, that I supervised for two years. Now, um, a senior researcher uh, back home in China and uh, soon to be an associate professor there. And uh, we try to model spa uh, spatial distribution of losses in China for debris flows. So uh, we had uh, the economical loss in, um, in uh, Yuan, Chinese Yuan. Uh, so we corrected them for the inflation because of course, uh, we need to correct them with respect to a static, uh, sorry, a stable currency like the dollar. We had the losses of volatilities, and uh, this is the distribution of the impact that each of these debris flows uh, produced, okay, for the whole territory of China. And what we try to do is to train a machine learning, uh, so a data-driven model, to predict the level of impact that a given location in China will experience. So you can see here, that uh, you will have a prediction for the impact level zero, so the lowest one, and a prediction for level five, so the, the worst case scenario. And uh, this is something that I cannot miss. I'm always looking uh, into pointing out that my student, the need for uncertainty estimations, these are the uncertainty maps as well for this process. And uh, it may look like a gigantic area here, but the model we built was at a pretty uh, um, detailed scale. So these are all small catchment that we pay based our prediction on. So um, with this, I would like to basically point out and I will finish my presentation that even if we try to predict the risk, so impact based solutions, um, we need to also monitor these processes in time because some of these needs to be really constantly monitored uh, in order for us to make a prediction. So this is the um, PhD uh, work of uh, Mukhtar Ahmed, uh, in uh, where we try to use INSAR-based uh, solution to monitor the formation for this gigantic landslide, uh, which we were lucky enough to capture its uh, one of its release because there are it's a gigantic one and there are few parasite landslides that occur and uh, uh, we are monitoring it because uh, below this huge landslide body and actually on this huge landslide bodies lie two cities so we are trying to be careful of what can happen so you can do prediction as much as you want and it's a good tool for sure but uh, prediction alone may not be enough so monitoring risk is also 
uh, sort of a requirement. And these are uh, the research direction also likely that the uh, European um, Union uh, has been following in the last years, funding a huge project for insert based uh, uh, time series uh, um, analysis for the entire European uh, uh, territory. Uh, and uh, what we're trying to do here at ITC is to do data driven models also for the deformation. So not trying to predict landslide occurrences, not only landslide sizes, not only not only impact, but also how fast this uh, uh, um, surface is deformed. And uh, uh, in the future, this will be even better because uh, soon uh, NASA will send a satellite that will not be suffering anymore from a vegetation cover because it's an L band instead of C. If I remember correctly, I may be wrong, I'm not an INSAR guy, but uh, it should be able to uh, go through the vegetation and really look into the entirety of the landscape without being hindered. Uh, from the vegetation shield. And uh, with this, I, I made it into 41 minutes. I hope it's okay. So I would like to thank you for listening to me and uh, thank all my students that uh, have helped so much. So.